Simpson, Simon, who has uh, uh, shown himself for over 20 years proof against the little god's arrows, <laughs> has now definitely announced his approaching marriage with Miss Hattie Doran, the fascinating daughter of a Californian millionaire. Miss Doran is an only child, and it is currently reported that her dowry will run to considerably over six figures. Hey, those are all the notices that appeared before the disappearance of the bride. Hmm? Before, before the what? The vanishing of the lady. When did she vanish, then? At the wedding breakfast. Lords and kings, even, were among the clients of my friend Sherlock Holmes. Watson is my name, Dr. Watson. And it was my privilege to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I'll tell you about the case of the noble bachelor. A moment, please. <laughs> it was a few weeks before my marriage in 1887, during the days when I was still sharing rooms with Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street. I had remained indoors all day, for the weather had taken a sudden turn to rain, with high autumnal winds. With my body in one easy chair and my legs upon another, I had surrounded myself with a cloud of newspapers. When at last I had saturated myself with the news of the day, I tossed them all aside and lay listless, speculating lazily upon the huge crest and monogram on the envelope upon the table, which awaited my friend's return. Well, Holmes, here's a very fashionable epistle. Oh, <laughs> this looks like one of those social summonses which call upon a man either to be bored or to lie. Oh, come, it may prove to be something of interest after all. Not social, then? Distinctly professional. Hmm. And from a noble client. One of the highest in England. My dear fellow, I congratulate you. I assure you, Watson, without affectation, but the status of my client is a matter of less moment to me than the interest of his case. Yes, of course, of course. It's just possible, however, that that also may not be wanting in this new investigation. Uh, you've been reading the papers diligently of late, have you not? <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> I've had nothing else to do. Well, it's fortunate. You will perhaps be able to post me up. I read nothing except criminal news in the agony column. The latter is always instructive. Mm. But if you followed recent events so closely... You must have read about Lord St. Simon and his wedding. Oh, yes, the deepest interest. Now, the letter which I hold in my hand is from Lord St. Simon. Oh, no. This is what he says. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Lord Backwater tells me that I may place implicit reliance upon your judgment and discretion. I have determined, therefore, to call upon you and to consult you in reference to the very painful event which has occurred in connection with my wedding. Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard is acting already in the matter, but he assures me that he sees no objection to your cooperation, and that he even thinks that it might be of some assistance. <laughs> I will call at four o'clock in the afternoon, and should you have any other engagement at that time, I hope you will postpone it, mm. as this is a matter of paramount importance, your faithful day, etc. Yeah. Mm, this is four o'clock. <laughs> Past three now. Then I have just time, with your assistance, to get clear upon the subject. Now, turn over those papers and arrange the extracts in their order of time. Have the goodness to pass me, Mr. Sisson. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Here you are. Yes. And uh, I will take a glance as to who our client is. This one, yes. Ah, yes, here he is. Robert Walsingham de Vere St. Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral, born 1846. That makes him 41 years of age. Mature for marriage. Uh, was under secretary for the colonies in a late administration. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they inherit Plantagenet blood by direct descent and Tudor on the distaff side. Uh, well, there's nothing very instructive in all this. I must turn to you, Watson, for something more solid. Well, I've had very little difficulty in finding what you want. The facts are quite recent. There was a paragraph in one of the society papers. Um, ah, here it is. There will soon be a call for protection in the marriage market, for the present free trade principle appears to tell heavily against our home product. 
One by one, the management of the noble houses of Great Britain is passing into the hands of our fair cousins from across the Atlantic. Lord St. Simon, who has uh, uh, shown himself for over 20 years proof against the little god's arrows, <laughs> has now definitely announced his approaching marriage with Miss Hattie Doran, the fascinating daughter of a Californian millionaire. Miss Doran is an only child, and it is currently reported that her dowry will run to considerably over six figures. Indeed. As it is an open secret that the Duke of Balmoral has been compelled to sell his pictures within the last few years, and as Lord St. Simon has no property, save the smallest state of Birchmore, it is obvious that the Californian heiress is not the only gainer by the alliance. Anything more? Well, those are all the notices that appeared before the disappearance of the bride. Hmm? Before, before the what? The vanishing of the lady. When did she vanish, then? At the wedding breakfast. Indeed. Well, this is more interesting than it promised to be. Quite dramatic, in fact. Yes, it struck me as being a little out of the common. And they often vanish before the ceremony and occasionally during the honeymoon. But I cannot call to mind anything quite so prompt as this. Ah, but there's a ring at the bell. And as the clock makes it a few minutes after four, I have no doubt that this will prove to be our noble client. No, don't dream of going, Watson. I very much prefer having a witness, if only as a check to my own memory. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed this case for words. Lord Robert and Simon. Good day, Lord and Simon. Good day, sir. Oh, uh, pray take the basket chair. Uh, now, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. I draw up a little to the fire, and we shall talk this matter over. A most painful matter to me, as you can most readily imagine, Mr. Holmes. I have been cut to the quick. I understand you have already managed several delicate cases of this sort, sir, though I presume that they were hardly from the same class of society. No, I am descending. I beg your pardon? My last client of the sort was a king. Oh, really? I had no idea. And which king? Hmm? Uh, the king of Scandinavia. What, has he lost his wife? You can understand that I extend to the affairs of my other clients the same secrecy which I promised to you no. in yours. Of course. Now, when did you first meet Miss Hattie Doran? In San Francisco, a year ago. Did you become engaged then? No. But you were on a friendly footing. I was amused by her society, and she could see that I was amused. Her father is very rich. He is said to be the richest man on the uh, Pacific Slope. And how did he make his money? In mining. He had nothing a few years ago. Then he struck gold, invested it, and came up by leaps and bounds. My wife was 20 before her father became a rich man. During that time, she ran free in a mining camp, so that her education has come from nature rather than from the schoolmaster. She is what we call in England, I believe, a tomboy. Quite. She is uh, impetuous. Volcanic, I was about to say. But on the other hand, I would not have given her the name which I have the honor to bear uh, had I not thought her to be, at bottom, a noble woman. The young lady came to London then, and you renewed your acquaintance. Yes. Uh, her father brought her over for this last season. I met her several times. We became engaged. Uh, I have now married her. She brought, I understand, a considerable dowry. No more than is usual in my family. And this, of course, remains to you since the marriage is a fait accompli. I really have made no inquiries on the subject. No, very naturally not. On the morning of the wedding, was she in good spirit? Never better. She was as bright as possible until after the ceremony. And did you observe any change in her then? Oh, it's childish. Uh, she uh, dropped her bouquet as we went towards the vestry. She was passing the uh, front pew at the time, and it fell over into the pew. There was a moment's delay, but the gentleman in the pew handed it up to her again. It, it didn't appear to be the worst for the fall. Yet, when I spoke to her about it, she answered me abruptly. Indeed. You you say there was a gentleman in the pew. Some of the general public were present then. Oh, yes. It's impossible to exclude them when the church is open. This gentleman was one of your wife's friends? No. No, I, I called him a gentleman by courtesy. At any rate, Lady St. Simon returned from the wedding in a less cheerful frame of mind than she had gone to it. Uh, what did she do on re-entering her father's house? I saw her in close conversation with her maid, Alice. A confidential servant? A little too much so. She is an American. She came from California with her. You did not overhear what they said. Lady St. Simon said something about jumping a claim. 
she was accustomed to using slang of that kind. I no idea what it meant. Mm, American slang is very expressive sometimes. And what did your wife do next? She uh, went into the breakfast room. On your arm? No, alone. She was very independent in little matters like that. Then, after we had sat down for ten minutes or so, she rose hurriedly, muttered some words of apology and left the room. She never came back. Her maid says she went to her room, covered her bride's dress with a long ulster, put on a bonnet and went out. One of the footmen remembers seeing a lady leave, but he refused to credit that it could have been his mistress. He naturally believed she was inside. Quite so. Afterwards, my wife is said to have been seen walking to Hyde Park with the woman who had caused the disturbance earlier on. The disturbance? Uh, yes. Uh, after we had returned from the church, uh, this woman apparently tried to follow us into the house. She had to be ejected by the butler of the football. Yes, but why should she want to force the way? Well, well Mr. Holmes, uh, she claimed that um, she and I... Uh, oh. Well, um, to tell the truth, her name is Flora Miller. She used to be a dancer at the Allegro. I have not treated her ungenerously, and she's no just cause for complaint against me. Did your wife hear this disturbance? No, thank goodness she didn't. And yet she was seen walking with this very woman afterward. Yes. And Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard looks upon it as very serious. It is thought that Flora decoyed my wife out and laid some terrible trap for her. I understand that she's now in custody. Well, it's a possible supposition. You think so, too? I don't think Flora would hurt a fly. I didn't say a probable one. Still, jealousy is a strange transformer of character. Pray then, Lord St. Simon, what is your own theory as to what took place? Oh, really? I came to seek a theory, not to propound one. And since you ask me, it has occurred to me that the excitement, the consciousness that she had made so immense a social stride may have caused some little nervous disturbance to my wife. In short, that she had become suddenly deranged? Well, when I consider that she has turned her back, I will not say upon me, but upon so much that many have aspired to without reason, I can hardly explain it in any other fashion. Well, that is certainly a conceivable hypothesis. And now, Lord St. Simon, I think I have nearly all my data. Oh, may I ask whether you and your wife were seated at the breakfast table so that you could see out of the window? We could see the other side of the road and the park. Quite so. Then I do not think I need to tell you any longer. I will communicate with you. Um, should you be uh, fortunate enough to solve this problem? Oh, I have solved it. Uh, what was that? I say I have solved it. Uh, where, then, is my wife? That is a detail which I shall speedily supply. I am afraid it will take wiser heads than yours and mine. Good day to you, gentlemen. Good day, sir. Lord St. Simon, to honour my head by putting it on a level with his own. Well, I think I shall have a whiskey and soda and a cigar after all that cross-questioning. Good. I have formed my conclusions as to the case before our cloud was nearly done. My dear Holmes. <laughs> uh, I have notes of several similar cases, though, as I remarked before, none of them were quite as prompt. Yes, I've heard all you've heard. Without, however, the knowledge of pre-existing cases, which serves me so well. Oh, but hello, here is Lestrade. Ah, you'll find an extra tumbler on the sideboard, and there are cigars in the box, Lestrade. Thank you. Evening, Dr. Watson. Evening, Inspector. Well, what's up, then? You look dissatisfied. Well, I feel dissatisfied. This is a furnace and siren marriage case. I can't make head nor tail of the business. Really? You surprised me. Well, I've been dragging the serpent down. In heaven's name, what for? Looking for the body of Lady St. Simon. <laughs> Have you dragged the basin of the Trafalgar Square fountain? Why? What do you mean? Because you've just as good a chance of finding this lady there as in the serpent tonight. I suppose you know all about it. Well, I've only just heard the facts, but my mind is made up. Oh, indeed. Then you think that the serpent time plays no part in the matter? I think it's very unlikely. Well, perhaps you'll kindly explain how it is we found these nearly. I have them here in my bag. Here. There's a little nut for you to crack, Master Holmes. Oh, indeed. See, Watson? Mm -hmm. A wedding dress, white satin shoes, and the bride's wreath and veil. And a wedding ring. You dragged these from the serpentine? No. 
They were found near the bank by a parkkeeper. They were identified as her clothes. It seemed to me that if the clothes were there, the body wouldn't be far off. And by the same brilliant reasoning, every man's body is to be found in the neighbourhood of his wardrobe. Hmm? And pray, what did you hope to arrive at through this? Some evidence implicating Flora Miller in the disappearance. I'm afraid you'll find it difficult. Hmm. This dress does implicate Miss Flora Miller. And how? In the dress is a pocket. In the pocket is a card case. In the card case is a note. Now listen to this. You will see me when all is ready. Come at once. F. H. M. Now, my theory all along has been that Lady St. Simon was decoyed away by Flora Miller. No doubt with confederates. Her initials were on this note. It was no doubt slipped into the bride's hand at the door, and it lured her into their reach. Ah, this is indeed important. Oh, you find it so? Extremely. I congratulate you warmly. Well, then. Well, you're looking on the wrong side. On the contrary. This is the right side. The right side? You're mad. The note is written in pencil on the back. Quite. And over here is what appears to be a fragment of a hotel bill. It interests me deeply. Oh, there's nothing in that. I looked at it before. I've seen nothing in that. Very likely not. It's most important all the same. As to the note, it's important also, or at least the initials are. So I congratulate you again. Oh, I've wasted time enough. I believe in hard work. I'm sitting by the fire, spinning theories. We shall see who gets to the bottom of this first. Nope. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Oh, um, just one hint to you, Lestrade. Okay. Hmm? I will tell you the true solution of this matter. Lady St. Simon is a myth. There is not, and there has never been, any such person. You're mad. Mad. <laughs> Well, Watson, they've laid the supper in my absence, I see. Well, I didn't know what it was all about. A confectioner's man came and set it all out. Cold woodcock, pheasant, pate de foie gras pie. Some rather exciting-looking bottles. Said they'd been paid for in order to this address. Capital. He's late for five. You seem to expect company. Uh, yes, I fancy we may have some company dropping in. Hmm. I'm surprised Lord St. Simon has not already arrived. Ah, I fancy I hear his step on the stairs now. Oh, so my message reached you then, Lord St. Simon. Yes, and I must confess, the contents startled me beyond measure. Have you good authority for what you say? The best possible. I can hardly see how the lady could have acted otherwise. Her abrupt method of doing it was undoubtedly to be regretted. But having no mother, she had no one to advise her at such a crisis. Oh, it was a slight, sir. A public slight. You must make allowance for this poor girl, placed in so unprecedented a position. I will make no allowance. I am very angry indeed. I have been shamefully used. Ah, there's the bell. If I cannot persuade you to take a lenient view, Lord St. Simon, I have brought an advocate here who may be more successful. Uh, come in, please, do. Lord St. Simon, allow me to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Francis A. Moulton. The lady I think you have already met. Good Lord. Howdy. You're angry, Robert. Oh, well, I guess you've every cause to be. Pray make no apologies oh, to me. Oh, yeah, I know I treated you real bad. I should have spoken to you before I went, but, well, I was kind of rattled. From the time I saw Frank here again, I just didn't know what I was doing or saying. I only wonder I didn't fall down and do a faint right there before the uh, altar. Mrs. Moulton, perhaps you would like my friend and me to leave the room while you explain this matter. If I may give an opinion, we've had just a little too much secrecy over this matter already. Oh, but For my part, I'd like all Europe and America to hear the rights of it. Then I'll tell our story right away. Frank and I met in 81 in McGuire's camp near the Rockies where Pa was working a claim. We were engaged, Frank and I, but one day Pa struck a rich pocket and made a pile, while poor Frank here had a claim that came to nothing. And the richer Pa grew, the poorer Frank got. So at last, Pa wouldn't hear of our engagement lasting any longer, and he took me away to Frisco. <laughs> Frank wouldn't throw in his hand, though. You bet. Frank followed me, and he saw me without Pa knowing. He said he'd go back, and he'd make his pile, too, and he wouldn't come to claim me till he had as much as Pa. So I... I promised I'd wait for him till the end of time and not to marry anyone else as long as he lived. So I said, why shouldn't we be married straight away then? Then I'll feel sure of you. But I won't claim to be your husband till I come back. Well, we talked it over, see? And we just went to a clergyman and did it right there. Good Lord. Well, 
the next I heard of Frank, he was in Montana, and then in New Mexico. And then there was a newspaper story about how a miner's camp had been attacked by Apache Indians, and there was Frank's name among the killed. I was sick for months. There was never another word of Frank after that. Well, you see, I was... Hold on, dear. Well, I felt all the time that no man on this earth could ever take Frank's place in my heart. But I meant to make Robert just as good a wife as it was in me to be. Oh, would you imagine what I felt first as I came to the altar rails? There was Frank. Standing, looking at me out of the first pew. Well, I thought it was his ghost at first. I looked again, and there he was still, with a with a kind of a question in his eyes. Oh, well, I didn't know if to stop the service and make a scene in the church. What the clergyman was saying was just like a bee buzzing in my ears. I scribbled her a note. Yeah, and on the way out again, I saw the piece of paper in his hand, and I knew it was for me. So I passed the pew, and I dropped my bouquet over, and he slipped the note into my hand when he gave it back. You never doubted for a moment that your first duty now was to hit. Well, of course. You see, I'd been a prisoner with those Apaches all the time. When I got back to Frisco, I saw in a paper about this other wedding. I just got to England in time. Frank was all for being open and telling what had happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I was so ashamed, thinking of all those lords and ladies waiting at that table for me to come back. So Frank took my wedding things and he dropped them anywhere in the park. He thought they wouldn't be found. We were off to Paris, France tomorrow, only... Only this gentleman, Mr. Holmes, came around. Yes. Well, Robert, you've heard it all. I'm very sorry if I've given you any pain. I hope you don't think very meanly of me. Excuse me, but it isn't my custom to discuss my most intimate personal affairs in this public manner. Oh, then you won't forgive me. You won't shake hands before I go. No, certainly. It'll give you any pleasure. Ah. I had hoped that you would have joined us in a friendly supper. I think that there you ask a little too much. <laughs> then I trust that you, at least, will honor us with your company, Mr. and Mrs. Bolton. It is always a joy to be, to meet an American, Mr. Bolton. Well, that's nice of you, Mr. Holmes. Well, Watson... The case has been an interesting one. Uh, It shows how simple the explanation may be of an affair which seems almost inexplicable at first sight. You had no doubt, then? From the first, two facts were obvious to me. One was that the lady was quite willing to undergo the marriage ceremony. The other was that she had repented of it within a few minutes of returning home. But she could not have spoken to anyone when she was out, for she'd been in the company of the bridegroom. Had she seen someone, then? If she had, it must have been someone from America. Then who could this American be? He might be a lover, he might be a husband. Mm. For instance, Simon told us of a man in the pew and the change in our manner and that transparent device of dropping her bouquet. Well, it all became absolutely clear. Especially in view of that allusion of hers to claim jumping, which in miners' talk means taking possession of that which another person has a prior claim to. It was clear to me that she'd gone off for the man, and the chances were in favor of his being a husband. How in the world did you find them? Friendless trade held information in his hands and didn't know the value of it. The initials on the note were of the highest importance, of course, but it was more valuable still to know that within a week, the man had settled his bill at one of the most select London hotels. But how did you deduce the select? Hmm? By the select prices. Eight shillings for a bed and eightpence for a glass of sherry pointed to one of the most expensive hotels. Well, there are not many in London which charge at that rate. In the second one I visited in Northumberland Avenue, I learned by an inspection of the book that Francis H. Moulton, an American gentleman, had left only the day before. On looking over the entries against him, I came upon the very items I'd seen in the duplicate bill. His letters were to be forwarded to 226 Gordon Square. So thither I travelled. The loving couple were fortunately at home, and I ventured to give them some paternal advice. I invited them to meet Lord St. Simon here, and to make their position a little clearer. There was no very good result. His conduct was certainly not very gracious. Oh, my dear Watson. Perhaps you would not be very gracious either if after all the trouble of wooing and wedding you found yourself deprived in an instant of wife and fortune. No, I think we may judge Lord St. Simon very mercifully and thank our stars that we're never likely to find ourselves 